Um, so those are the four madhabs that are considered normative in Sunni Islam. And I want to use this as an opportunity to talk a little bit about sectarian divisions. In Islam, sects originated over disputes over political succession and over points of law. And doctrinal differences only crept in much later. Sunni Islam, made up of these four rites, accounts today and in most periods of Muslim history for around about 90% of all Muslims. So Islam has been comparatively lucky in not being too um, divided by, by schism. 90% of Muslims are, are Sunnis. Um, there is a small sect which originated right at the beginning of Islam called the Kharijites, to whom you will occasionally see allusions. Nowadays, there's only perhaps half a million of them left. Kharijites. A um, few villages in Algeria and Oman is officially a Kharijite country. Um, these are a rigorists um, who originated for political reasons. Um, because they refused to accept the authority of the fourth caliph, Ali. They thought he wasn't pious enough, so they withdrew from him. Um, in practice, they're very unlikely ever to meet any. Uh, much more successful were the other great schismatic group in Islam, the Shia. Uh, that's the plural, the name of the denomination, a singular... <coughs> One individual person from the Shi'a is called a Shi'i, with an I at the end, um, sometimes partially anglicised to Shi'ites. Famous because the Shi'a are the prevailing denomination in Iran. They also account for about half of the population of Iraq, maybe a third of the population of Pakistan, a majority of the population of Azerbaijan. Those are the four places really where you'll find Shi'a. In the West, they're not particularly numerous. They have a few mosques in the United States and a handful of mosques in, in England. Um, but they, they don't have an extensive diaspora. Um, the point of, of dispute between the Shia and the, the Sunnis, again, is not basically doctrinal. It is to do with questions of legitimate succession to the Prophet. The Shia believe that the, that Ali, the Prophet's son-in-law, should have succeeded him as temporal ruler of the Muslims following the Prophet's death. So we get this name Shia, which means the faction. The Shi'at Ali are the faction of Ali, the upholders of Ali's legitimate caliphate, caliphate, i.e. succession to the Prophet. The Sunnis say, no, we believe that Abu, that Abu Bakr, the Prophet's close friend and companion, was the legitimate first ruler, and he indeed became the first ruler. So, as you can see, it's not primarily a denominational split, it's to do with um, early politics. But, um, as is quite frequent in the history of religions, an originally political split acquired a doctrinal <coughs> colouring over time, and the Shia do have certain beliefs that are distinct from the beliefs of Sunni Muslims most conspicuously in their concept of the source of authority in religion. As I mentioned, Sunni Muslims accept the Quran, the Hadith, and a few other things like this Ijma and Qiyas as the sources of religious authority. The Shia say, no, we accept the Quran, and we'll accept some of the Hadith as a secondary authority, but we're really more interested in the interpretations of the law as delivered by the Prophet's descendants through his daughter Fatima, who married the Caliph Ali. And so sometime in the second or third century of Islam, we find appearing a theory of uh, infallibility. Twelve Imams, descendants of the Prophet, who were regarded as infallible, rather in the sense of, of contemporary papal infallibility, if you like, that their every utterance and form of behavior was guided by God and hence formed part of the Sunnah, was an authoritative source of law and doctrine. And this is the point um, at which the Shia depart doctrinally from Sunni Muslims. Sunni Muslims accept the Quran, the Hadith, and these lesser sources. The Shia accept the Quran and the utterances of the 12 Imams. The 12th Imam, a certain Muhammad al Mahdi, disappeared. He went into a state of occultation. Um, again, one of these slightly uncomfortable Orientalist translations of the Arabic 
word reiba, which means disappearance. He just vanished. And according to mainstream Shia belief, he didn't die. He merely was occulted, um, entered the hidden realm, and he will appear as the eschatological savior of the Shia and of the Muslim world at the end of time. He will be the Mahdi, the, the divinely guided um, savior. And the mainstream Shia belief is that the hidden Imam, who is in the state of occultation, is in mystic communication with the appointed hierarchical leadership of the Shia Muslims. I mentioned that Sunni Islam doesn't have a hierarchy, doesn't like hierarchies, it's against the mentality. Shia Islam is more Christian in a sense, in as much as it has this idea of an ultimately infallible hierarchy inspired by God that <coughs> mediates authority. Christianity's case, the church being the bride of Christ, in the case of um, the Shia, the hidden Imam being the sort of quasi-divine figure who inspires the living representatives of the, the denomination with infallible guidance. Also the, the emphasis on the idea of a savior, the end of time, um, much more important for the Shia than for the Sunnis, suggests that there's a, a parallel between Shiism and, and Christianity, which is perhaps interesting. The Twelve are Shia, those who accept these twelve Imams account for the great majority of the Shia. There's also a smaller denomination called the Ismailis. Um, they're called Ismailis because they follow uh, the elder son of the seventh Imam, Ja'far al-Sadiq, the sixth Imam, Ja'far al-Sadiq, and his descendants, um, were, uh, which the Twelve Shia don't. And they don't accept there are twelve Imams, they say that the succession of Imams continues to the present day. And the main Ismaili denomination now rep recognizes the Aga Khan as the present Imam. He is the divinely inspired, immaculate leader. You've heard of the Aga Khan, presumably? Yeah? It's a kind of um, international banker with associations with the UN and big business interests, very wealthy. Um, there's perhaps three or four million Ismaili Muslims in the world today, mainly in fairly remote places. There are quite a few amongst the Asian community of Kenya. You'll find quite a few in rural areas of India. You'll find them in Badakhshan, in northern Afghanistan, um, and so forth, and quite an extensive diaspora in the West. So that's the sectarian situation. As you'll see, it's complex, but not so complex as it is, say, in Christianity for reasons that scholarship is not entirely clear about, despite the absence of a hierarchical organization that can define and, if necessary, impose an orthodoxy, Islam has been less subject to schism than has Christianity. Um, so that the practices and beliefs taught and followed in a little mosque in Senegal, in West Africa, really do not differ from those that you'll find in a mosque in Sumatra at the other end of the Muslim world, despite the absence of a hierarchy to, to hold the show together. Um, <coughs> that's all I wanted to say about sects and about the, the constitution of Islamic law.